Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. First off, I just wanna say that I hope you guys are doing okay wherever you are in the world. I know it's a very uh, weird time right now, and I just hope that you guys are all doing well. Uh, for that reason, I find it quite hard to find things to review or talk about new products. So I suppose my next video is for quite a while to be more tutorials and stuff that you can do with the technology that you already have. So today's video will be a Final Cut Pro tutorial, however if you are a beginner do feel free to watch. Um, this is more advanced, however you might learn a thing or two even if it's just learning more about the interface of Final Cut Pro. So when I was deciding what to pick, I decided to do something that I was doing myself. Now I'm currently working on a pitch for a short film to get some funding for it. Um, I suspect we're going to be having to pitch for it in the next few weeks. And one thing that's coming up in terms of the budget is wondering how we're going to be able to feasibly do a nighttime shoot for one of the key scenes. And there's obviously different solutions and as a producer, you know, one thing that I have to think about is shooting day to night. However, that's really tricky. Um, that said though, I've been an editor far longer than I've been a producer. I've been an editor first and foremost and always will be forever. Uh, just with so many more years of being an editor. So I actually got some drone footage, uh, not my own, and it's actually of the location that we were thinking about shooting in. So using Final Cut Pro, I did a feasibility study using this drone footage to see if I could do day to night with similar shots that we'd hoped to get ourselves on our second unit shooting. So I'm going to show you a tutorial about how we turned these day shots into these night shots. Here we are in Final Cut Pro, a huge shout out to Michael O'Reilly, this is his footage uh, from Dunedy Woods. We actually plan if we get the funding to shoot here, so like these are actually the forest that we'll be shooting in for some of our shots. So this is a great way to kind of pre viz what it could potentially look like if we decide to do it at night time. And as I said before, I'm doing more of a feasibility test to make sure that if we do decide to shoot at night time, uh, we have different options, whether it's actually shooting at night time, which is obviously more expensive, or doing day to night. So this is the clip that we're going to be using for our first shot. I'm actually going to be going from harder to easier. And out of the four shots, this is the hardest for several reasons. Um, you obviously see there's literally lens flare. There's like a lot of light bleeding in from this corner. There's a lot of light in the uh, the pond or in the lake. And um, it's clearly a daytime shot. So I have still tutorial set up. I'm going to walk us through it. And I'm going to talk about some of the mistakes you might make and the proper way to go about this. However, as I emphasized before, you definitely don't want to be doing the, doing this. This is a like last resort scenario. Um, please don't try to fix it in post and do this. If you can shoot at night time, actually shoot at night time. But for whatever reason, it might be budgetary reasons or anything like that, um, you might have to do day to night. And later on in the video, as I show you different examples, I'm going to show you more ideal settings for doing day to night. But this is like one of the most unideal scenarios or for, for, for your shot that you just have to make look day to night. So this again is the shot. This is what most people do. And the, way, the reason why most people do this is because what we're using here is basically a LUT. So what we're looking at here is a LUT. And that's what most people do. And it doesn't look good. I mean, it does. it's clearly daytime. However, that's the mistake most people use is that they go online, they try to find a filter that can do day to night and it just doesn't work well. So in this case, this one's built into Final Cut Pro and it's called day to night. I even added in some vignetting to try and make it more effective. It doesn't work. It's clearly, um, it's clearly daytime. And the reason why LUTs will never work is that all LUTs do is convert one color into another color. I mean, that's why it's called a lookup table. So LUTs will not come to save you if you're trying to do day to night. Um, it doesn't matter how many LUTs you apply, um, it just won't work. However, as I mentioned before though, and you're gonna see this later on, a LUT might actually work if your cinematographer is knowingly shooting day for night and you guys make some decisions about where you point the camera. But we'll get to that towards the end of the tutorial as I move on to some of the easier shots to do day to night. But here's like a classic uh, day shot. How do we turn this into night? So this is what you really want. And even this is not perfect, which is why I'm saying at all costs, avoid trying to fix it in post because it's like, this is not perfect. I think to some people, if you're watching this tutorial, it's probably not convincing to you. The question though, as an editor is, does the is the audience going to buy it? I think if you just snuck this shot in, 
and the rest of your shots look good, the audience would buy the shot. I think they feasibly would buy the shot. It's not a great shot. Um, again, if you're into film and stuff like that, you can clearly tell this was during during the day. But again, the million dollar question with any editing job you should be doing is, will my audience buy this? And I think under the right circumstances, an audience would buy this shot. So I'm going to show you step by step how I got to this rather than trying to use a lush and ending up with that crap. So what I'm going to do is walk you step by step through the effects I'm using and why I'm doing that, the reasoning behind it. And hopefully it gives you a better sense of the ideas and the things you should be thinking about if you're planning to do it day and tonight. I think a lot of people just focus too much on colour, whereas you need to focus on what's contextual to your clip. And really, I suppose, think about what you're trying to do with the footage. So in this case, the first thing I did was I applied a graduated mask. And as you can see, the reasoning for that was that I needed to try and dim the light that was coming from that upper left corner. So I put a graduated mask on, it's built into Final Cut Pro. And again, you can I just kind of aimed it in that general direction. So in terms of, it usually starts at 100, so it'll look black to you. And I went for 79, 93, usually something like in the 80 is pretty good. And what's great is you can actually keyframe this. I'll show you another shot later on where I do keyframe. But for this shot, I keep it consistent uh, throughout. So we're just going to play with that single effect so you can kind of see what the difference that did. So I made the shot by itself already more moodier because we took some of the light out. Again, that's what you're trying to do when you're doing day and night is really get rid of any light sources because it's night time. There shouldn't be any sunshine. There shouldn't be any brightness. There shouldn't be any sky. It should be dark. So that helped us a little bit. It's not perfect though because no matter what we do to this footage, there's a freaking sun going into the shot, which again, I can't emphasize enough. Try not to shoot day for night if you have the money or the possibility of how. However, there's different reasons why. For example, this is a drone camera. And if you're using a low cost drone, a pro the footage at night time probably doesn't look very good. So I can understand why in some cases you'd need to shoot day for night. Um, that's why some people do it. But again, um, I can't stress this enough. Don't fix it in post. So. That's our first effect. Now the second effect we're going to go for is a vignette. And again, the purpose of a vignette is just to really make the shot as dark as possible, even take more light out of the shot. So in this case, we just blurred a lot of the corners and um, blurring is a feature we're going to be using later on because hiding your mistakes at nighttime is, uh, is something that everybody does, including Game of Thrones. We all remember that episode, which was like basically shot in pitch black because that helped the VFX teams quite a lot. But you know, we have it set to maximum one. And in terms of size, um, this is kind of the size I went for. Um, it's really important to note though, is that I really brought in the fall off as close as I possibly could before it just like cuts off and it's like fully black. So I really brought that sucker in as much as I could. This is really where the big changes happen. And what you need to do is go into your colors and find your color curves. And we're going to be using color curves to really take the light out of this shot. So you're about to see something really dramatic now. And that is we, we reduced a lot of light from the shot. So let's go into our inspector and see what I did. So the first thing I did was I really took that Luma down. So if I take the Luma back up, as you can see, it was a really bright shot. The way you are gonna do this is that you're gonna just pull this down. So you're just gonna go for a straight line. And you, again, each shot is different. There is no formula when it comes to editing or doing day to night or any type of color grading. Um, I know everybody loves formulas. I think that's why LUTs are so popular. You know, you can just throw a LUT on it and hope for the best. But if you're really editing for film and you're taking it seriously, each shot has to be individually crafted. Um, you just can't really copy and paste uh, colors over. Um, it, it just won't work because each setup your, cinema, your cinematographer does is gonna be different. So you basically do this and then really it's just, a, it's, it's an experimenting game of getting the effect the way to look the way you want it. So you're going to be kind of making these bends and these, angle, these uh, round corners on your lumograph. And you're going to be always constantly niggling and trying to figure out which way it looks best for you. 
remember the lower areas will affect the brightness of the darker areas and this side is obviously the brightest area which is why I went for a straight line because I'm adjusting the brighter part of the picture so if I do this you can see that I'm really um, bringing down the brightness of that so like you can kind of see what I'm trying to say there but what I ultimately do, uh, went for was this so basically everything from the dark part of the shot was to about here the mids I raised a little bit which kind of shows you this effect so I'm going to just manipulate these so we can see what each one does so you can see this really affects the dark part of the trees right and this is really kind of affecting the water and some of the elements with the sky here here we kind of just again affect more of the sky and the water and then this is like your major transformation do you see the way by pulling this down we're literally reducing the light from the water that that's the shine of the sun and we're literally trying to pull that down as much as we can we can't go too far though because uh the dynamic range isn't there because again this is probably a cheaper drone camera i pulled this footage from youtube and um, if you had an ari alexa or something in the sky you could probably get much better results because the dynamic range would be there but you know we kind of brought it down to something like this level um i actually left it like that it just looks a bit more natural because again if um the, the image quality isn't there you're going to end up with just like um really bad color diffusion and differentiation and as you can see it looks quite pixelated as it is once we start playing around with luma like that after that what you really want to do then is that these are your other colors and you can adjust these so this will make the shot more um by taking the red out it's gonna obviously make the shot more green or we can infuse it with a ton of red and i guess the reason why i'm showing you this is that i'm kind of trying to trojan horse in just how powerful the new color um, correction tools and Final Cut Pro are. I mean, they've been around, they've been out for a few months now, but I don't think many people know and realize how powerful color grading and Final Cut Pro has gotten. Um, you can do some amazing stuff in Final Cut Pro. You don't have to go to DaVinci Resolve anymore unless it's a really uh, big job because there still isn't uh, object tracking or anything like that. But you know, for an entire shot, you can do quite a lot with uh, DaVinci Resolve or with uh, Final Cut Pro. So, for this first color curve, all I really focused on actually was taking the blue out. So um, if you just did the luma back there, uh, you'd actually just have like a load of blue in your shot. So that if you're doing, if you're playing along at home, you probably noticed that. So all I did then was from the darker side, I took the blue out and then on the brighter side, I added blue in. So I'm gonna just basically show you step by step what that looks like. So when I pull out at the bottom, you can see I just removed the blue from the water, which is what you want because at night time there really shouldn't be any color bleeding. Again, there's no light source, there's nothing that's bouncing, so there should be kind of a swampiness and a, a sameness to the shot. So the, 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 the lake should be a bit of a swamp. And then up here, I'm just adding a bit of blue in because ultimately, like a midnight sky would have like a naviness to it. So that's why I kind of ended up with this um kind of swirl pattern. Uh, which is kind of more like this. this is actually what I ultimately went for so for my first color curve that's what I did uh, again really experiment with luma and experiment with blue again you can't just copy this what I'm doing here it won't work for your shot probably each shot is different and you really need to contextualize what you're trying to do with the light and the color in that shot so again with the light for us it was about just taking as much light out of the sky as possible and removing the light from the uh, the water and making the water as dark as possible and we're very fortunate in this shot that we could actually do that again you might not be as lucky which is why this is a last resort and you can't always fix it in post and if you can it still might not look 100% convincing so that's our first color cur curve our second color curve uh, builds on top of that again as you can see we have a lot of effects on this one shot and uh, we're going to add this on and what you really see happen here is I made the water even darker. So I call this a secondary grade. And the reason why we're calling it a secondary grade is that we're trying to isolate a certain area in this image. And again, as you can see, this is where it becomes really uh, specific and perfectionist 
in that, again, we were really trying to make this look as convincing as possible. So for this case, we're trying to make the water as dark as possible because as you can see, it's just way too bright, even though we toned it down quite a bit. So we had to isolate the water and make it as dark as possible. How do we do that? Well, first off, we need to do, um, you're actually gonna start off with a color mask. I'm gonna just say it off the bat. So if you do basically a duplicate of color curve one, and we go in here, as you can see, this looks weird, but I'll explain that in a second. But we'll go in, and as for the Luma, um, I'm basically just pulling that, and uh, just taking the red out of the water, as you just see there. Uh, I do nothing with the green, and I do nothing with the blue. Now, you might be saying to yourself, how did I just affect that specific area? Well, basically, this is called a color mask and you can basically click it from here so we're going to add a color mask and uh, basically that's a first way of isolating an area we're trying to find a certain color in this image and manipulating it so i'm going to put it over the water and as you can see i'm trying to select that area of the water and i just captured that there and that's why if you go to view masks this is basically a form of masking by color uh, we picked up the water unfortunately we picked up the sky too which is why earlier on um we ended up with that happening so for this shot um in terms of making the water darker with the luma basically i just went for the midpoint and just brought it down so we got like an even curve on the luma scale and as you can see it's still not perfect so another thing that I do is I use the softness and you can actually see with the softness it really kind of bleeds the edges together you can go as basically as high as you want so for uh what I actually did at the end was I actually went for the full 150 but as you can unfortunately see it just takes everything out I mean it really affects every part of the shot because again the mask is affecting everything so another thing then you're gonna have to do is what we call a shape mask and then this is where you can really highlight a certain area. So I basically, you can see it starts off in a circle shape. And uh, I just go for a full square, to be honest with you. Uh, what I'm basically trying to do is I want to affect the water, but not the sky. So I pull it out to as much as the water as possible. But as you can see, it goes nowhere near the sky. And we're able to contextually uh, get rid of the water, the brightness from the water and uh make it look darker and i'm just going to pull it up because i didn't go that far I kind of it's more like this so as you can see that's how you kind of do something really contextual and um, you're using a color mask to isolate the color of the water when it was really bright and then we're doing a shape mask to make sure we're not messing up the sky because that's what it did i mean it kind of affected everything now you might like that look um but for me it's just it's just too much so this is kind of what i went for at the end ultimately so that's kind of what I did and uh, that's basically how I kind of got to here. I mean, that's what it looks like. Uh, that's, that was my second color curve done. Next, I did a color board and all I did here from what I believe is I just took a lot of saturation out of the image. I just completely uh, took out the midpoint and then this is my midtones. I just put them more in the blue spectrum. So uh, that's pretty simple. Um, you guys should obviously be familiar with your color boards at this point because um, that's like the most generic thing you can do in terms of color correction and color grading in Final Cut Pro. And um, because as you can see, this is quite saturated, I really need to remove the color. Why is it so saturated? When you reduce Luma in something, it actually increases like the saturation of a color because you're pulling the white out. So the less white it is, the more color it has. And at nighttime, nothing should be too colorful because there's no light source to show the color you need to desaturate the image. Again, really think about what do things look like at nighttime. Again, that's kind of where the art comes into it, um, where you have to really think about real life and what nighttime looks like. Now, day and night, this is really interesting. There's nothing wrong with LUTs, but you need to understand what a LUT does. So a LUT just finds you know, a set of colors and converts it into another set of colors. And again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a LUT, but it just won't solve your issues. It's going to give you something like this. However, you can totally use a LUT with all these color corrections, which I did. Again, LUTs can be great, but you just need to know how to use them. So I just added a LUT in, and as you can see, it just made the image slightly darker, slightly bluer. You know, it's for the better since I added it. Well, 
Maybe, maybe not. It's certainly a more bluer image. But again, I'm just trying to show you, you can totally use LUTs when you're trying to do this, but a LUT by itself isn't gonna do much. As you can see, everything else we've done beforehand significantly made the image look more like nighttime than the LUT did. So we added a LUT on. Uh, next thing I did is I added a hue and saturation curve. Again, this is really just another way for me to desaturate the image. What I targeted was uh, th these red trees. I'm not sure if you can kind of see them, but these orangey ones, I just kind of uh, isolated them. Again, you can use the color picker or you can actually just manually go for this, the color scale. And I just desaturated that. So you can kind of see, I can, I can make it really saturated or I can desaturate it as I did there. And um, that's all I did for that, uh, for this correction. Again, it's so contextual, it's so specific. Again, each effect has a specific job for this shot, which is why we ended up with so many of them. But that's essentially what you have to do to make day and tonight look as convincing as you possibly can. Final thing that I did is I added on a Gaugasian blur. And the reason why I did that is we're trying to cover up some of these um, kind of pixelated issues that you can sometimes get when you do a lot of color grading. This actually is more of an issue with the sharpness of the camera. So there's nothing wrong with blurring your footage. I know that can sometimes seem like a bit of a sin, but if you're trying to hide mistakes, and again, you're doing day and tonight, so you're kind of doing, you're doing a last resort job anyway, definitely blur your footage. Um, you have to blur it slightly, you can't blur it too much, because I mean, like if it looks like that, then I mean, no one can see it. But I definitely add a slight blur on just to decrease the sharpness because again, this drone footage was a very, very sharp and you can kind of see uh, with the water here, that's like looking at the water. Um, there's like a sharpness to it there. So that's why I kind of blurred it a little because um, I didn't want it to uh, be too sharp. So otherwise it kind of, see the way it's kind of, see the way like if it's fully sharp, you kind of get like these little wrinkles. And again, I'm trying to hide as many things as possible. You blur your shot a little. And then finally, like that's a letterbox. That, just kind of, that does what it says on the tin. Your letterbox should always be a final effect in a shot because a letterbox in Final Cut Pro, depending on where it's placed, will affect everything else. Your letterbox should always be last. Um, Likewise, your graduated masks and your vignettes, that should probably be done first. Uh, the vignettes are not really important. In fact, if you play around, it will give you a different effect depending on where you put it. And you actually might prefer, no, you might prefer the vignette to be there because it affects the sky up here differently. But um, I kept it here because I want to get, as rid of, get rid of as much light as possible from the shot. So that's ultimately how I ended up with something like that. So if we do our before and after, this is our before. And this is our after. Again, it certainly does not look perfect. I am not saying that, but again, the name of the game, if you're doing a mercy, fix it in post, rescue edit, and I ask you to do day to night, the question always is, does will the viewer buy this you know is it convincing what does the rest of the scene look like in terms of how that pulled off day and tonight because again if it's only one shot like this in an otherwise perfect sequence i think that people would buy this i think it's convincing enough um again if you're watching this tutorial it's probably not convincing to you but again to a layman's eye and you know where they're not rendered render just like passively watching it and you're you know it's a 20 minute short film or you know even a feature film they're probably you know like it's it's going to be very it's going to be a passive experience looking at this shot so they're probably not going to think too much about it and therefore as an editor you did your job you know they bought the idea that this is a nighttime shot even though it's clearly a very bright daytime shot so this is what i call the hardest shot out of them all and again, the reasons why is that you just got so much light in the water there and you have literally the sun and the sky bleeding in and it's a white sky because you're going to hear me talk about different color skies later on. But it's important to note that this is a white. There's no blue. This is as white as it gets. This is like the worst case scenario. Well, <laughs> honestly, it can get worse than this. But in terms of the footage I had to play with, this was like a pretty hard shot to do because again, you have reflections in the water. It's a tough shot. 
This is our second clip, and this is a rotation of a castle. So basically, problems again is you have light bleeding in. You actually have light bleeding in from even more corners. You have light bleeding in from here. You got light bleeding in from here, up here, and down here. It's just full of light. Again, if you throw a lot onto it, day into night, this is what you get. It's not convincing in the slightest. This is ultimately what we want. This is actually a very, very dark shot. Um, again, that's why it's not perfect, you know, because after you do all these things, can your audience even see what's going on? Um, you know, will it look cheap? Because it's very clear that it's been so affected to look like nighttime that you can barely see what's happening in the shot besides the highlights of the, uh, the castle there and some of the grass. So how do we get to this situation? Well, it's a lot of things that we did before. However, as I said, each shot is different. And as you can see, I have a different range of effects here. So I'm just gonna go ahead and disable all of these. I'm gonna do this in reverse so I can kind of get an idea of what each thing does. And then we'll go through them again one by one. So this again is basically our base footage. See, it's exactly the same. The first thing I did was I added so many graduated masks to this. This is like if you use a graduated filter on your actual camera and uh, it just removes a portion of the light. And again, I went for actually 94. I was more aggressive. I was just like, that's full black. Like, so I really went aggressive with 94. And again, I just tried to take some of the light out that was bleeding in from the top. However, just light bleeding in from every single corner. So I did one from the bottom. I did one from the left and I did one from the right. Again, I'm really trying to take out as much light as possible from this shot. And then I added in my vignette to try and make the corners as dark as possible to give it a dark feel because at night time visibility is less. You wouldn't see into the distance as much. It should be blurrier and uh, that's what a vignette can do for you. And then before you know it, we're back with our color curves. So let's go and inspect it and see what I went for. So as you can see, each time you do color curves, you can always be doing something different. So what I kind of went for in this situation is I really pulled this down and then I kind of went for a little bend here. And that's because I, I tried to raise the mid-tones as much as I possibly could while bringing down these really harsh highlights. So you can kind of see how that affects the roof on the castle there. And um, again, you have to really experiment with these and see what it's doing to your image. And it's also affecting the brightness on the, the, the pavement there. So that's kind of why I went for kind of a bendy curve on the Luma scale. And again, it's all experimental and you really have to play around with it to get the effect that you want. So in this situation is I actually took the red out of the image. So let's have a look of what it did look like with the red in. As you can see, it's quite red. So I just took some of the red out so it goes more green because um, there shouldn't be a lot of color at nighttime. Uh, there really shouldn't be red unless you're trying to do like a bleeding sunset or something. Um, at night time, it's always more in the blues and the greens. So that's why you pull the red out. That said though, I'm also pulling a lot of the green out. Why did I pull a lot of the green out? Because if I didn't, it's a very saturated image. You could definitely use color board or the hue saturation curves, but for some odd reason, I was like, ah, to hell with it, let's just do it inside of color curves. And likewise, I also took the blue out. And in this situation, I went for a shape where I really removed it from the shadows because as you can see, a really kind of, um, it's it, the point is defined here. It's not defined up here at the highlights and it's not defined here at the midtones. So that was trying to remove um, some of the blue from more of the shadowy part of the image. Whereas I kind of overall wanted to remove green from everywhere. So I went for a smooth, uh, pull down the middle because then you get like this more of a softer um, gradient for your highlights and your shadows. It's not going to look as a uh, bitty. Whereas if you do something like that or you do something like that. So it's a more evenness of uh, having less screen in your image. I know that sounds like word salad, but I'm sure you guys understand what I mean. That was my first color curve. Likewise, the second, what did I do here? I really targeted the grass. So as you can see, the color mask was targeting that color green because I went for the grass. And what did I do to the grass? I made the grass even darker from more of a low to midpoint. That's your mid, that's your midpoint. 
in terms of uh, your mid-tones and everything here is like your lower and this is your higher so it's like a low to mid point and I really just tried to reduce the grass from um, the shine off the grass because there's a uh, grass on top of the castle here and um, if I didn't have it it just you can see there's a light source coming from somewhere and that's the sky so we have to pretend there's no sky so we're removing any type of shyness and that's why we kind of have it in the low to mid section as we do. But as you can see though, I also have some of it uh, removed from the highlights. I, it's, it's not just a, a linear curve. I also brought some of it down like this. And um, you can kind of see the difference. It's very uh, subliminal, but it does make the difference all the same. So didn't do anything with the reds, didn't do anything with the greens, but again with the blues, as you can see, we uh, did that curve once again where you kind of pull down at the, the shadows and you pull up at the highlights because again if it's a night sky um, your highlights would be kind of a navy blue and again you wouldn't really have it in the darker area. So I've again removed it from there and as you can see that's how it's affecting kind of this darker portion of the image and then as you can see it actually doesn't do much when I pull it up here and um, it's very subliminal which you might, I don't even know if you're gonna be able to see it on my screen capture, but it's it's slightly there. And that's why I ended up with another uh, curve like this for the blue. So by now you should kind of get a jig of what I'm doing. Again, it should be making more sense about the patterns and the tools we're using. We're using a lot of curves, graduated masks, vignettes. These are what's in your toolkit and that's what you should be using when you're doing day into night. And you should have that probably in all of your editing software, not just Final Cut Pro. It should be obviously in your Adobe, it should be in, it's not in your Avid, I don't think. Avid isn't really supposed to do stuff like that. If you're working in Avid, you're probably outsourcing to an editing house and using DaVinci Resolve to do your day into nights. What does the hue saturation curves do in this situation? Well, I actually targeted the yellows and the greens. I actually just adjusted the hue. And this is where I'm trying to kind of Trojan horse in just some really cool things you can do to an image. I mean, you could have a purple sky. You know what I'm saying? You could be really creative. And that's what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower you in this tutorial to show you different possibilities. You're gonna discover what you can do with color along the way that can hopefully help you tell really interesting stories. And um, you know, you could have maybe a sci-fi film where the sky turned purple and you can kind of get some really cool effects. So um, I'm Trojan horsing in some creativity, hopefully into your mind about different possibilities that you can do a color. Um, and again, again, what I'm just doing here is I'm just removing some of the saturation from the grass because there's less color at night time. And that's basically it for the hue and saturation curves. Again, like it's really starting to uh, have a similarity with what we did with this shot. We're using a lot of the same effects. Likewise, we're using a Gaussian blur to hide our mistakes and you know, some of the, uh, I suppose, the hiccups that can come with doing something like this. And ultimately, just again, you can use a lot. You can totally use a lot. This is the day and tonight lot. It's actually very dark now that I see it applied here. Like, I mean, you could to you could definitely reduce it like to maybe 40 or something. Um, but again, I'm just trying, the reason why I'm using LUTs is not that, that they're not the enemy, but you can't just use a LUT by itself. A LUT finds, you know, a set of colors and converts it into another set of colors. So again, if I'm just trying to convert a set of colors into another set of colors, and I like those set of colors, use a LUT. And you can even adjust how much of the lot you use, you know, the, the, the amount of it, the blend, the blendness of it. So uh, I settled for kind of 40. I mean, that's very blue. Finally, I know I have my letterbox because you got know, the letterbox that footage to give it that cinematic look. And uh, if, again, if your cinematographer just decides they're shooting in two, three, or they're shooting in cinemascope. So that's kind of how you end up with that effect. Again, it's much uh, more convincing than just throwing a lot onto it. Throwing a lot onto it will never work. If there's one lesson you learn from this tutorial, you just can't throw a lot onto it. Um, well, actually, you're gonna see later on, maybe you can. Um, but I can see that that's how you do it. This is our before. And this is our after.
Now, uh, why is this shot and this shot hard? Likewise, I explained that one pretty in depth. But this one, there's just light coming in from everywhere. There's light coming in from here, light coming in from here, 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 light coming in from freaking everywhere. That's why we have four graduated masks. So these two shots are what I'd call the most unideal. Again, it can get worse than this, but with the footage we have here, these two shots are like the hardest. Now, how about this shot? Well, at first glance, this might actually seem really difficult because you're like, Jesus, there's like, you can see the full sky there. This could be a nightmare. Well, if you actually go back a little bit, it's really important to note, this is not a white sky. This is a blue sky. And if you have to shoot the sky, talk to your cinematographer and make sure the sky is blue. That means the, fo the, the footage cannot be overexposed and you can't blow blow the sky out. The sky needs to be blue if you're doing day and night. Why is that? Because you can get a really nice effect like this. This is one of the better shots. You might not think that at first glance, but as you can see, that looks pretty damn good. And again, we can really take advantage of having a blue sky. So that's kind of where more of color theory comes into it. But um, the more color the sky is, the better. So you want a nice blue sky. What does it look like with a LUT on it? It looks more like early dawn. That's what a LUT, that's what a day into night LUT does for you. It doesn't do much. But we can totally do day into night. And again, this is where these are some of the easier shots that you can kind of trick into looking day into night. And again, the highlight here is that the sky is blue and the water is also very dark. There's no really any white spots in the water because even these highlights here are blue because the sky is blue. This is what you want your shot to look like if the sky has to be in the footage. You want a blue sky. So again, if you have to shoot day tonight, talk to your cinematographer. If you're doing like, you know, previs or you're posting, blue sky, like that's like a VFX requirement, blue sky. So let's go in and see how we got here. So as I said at the beginning of the tutorial, well actually first off we'll work from reverse to see what each of these do individually. Um, as I said in the beginning, you can actually keyframe your graduated mask. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> Never mind, folks, I actually didn't. Oops, I lied. Um, you can though. I guess I'll just show you how you could do something like that. Um, did I? No, I actually didn't. I keyframed the wrong thing. ID keyframe. I uh, just put something like that there. Uh, the reason why you could keyframe is because um, there's no sky at the very end. So you could totally do something like this if you wanted to. You're gonna have to play. Honestly, you don't have to keyframe if you don't want to, because you're probably going to introduce more problems for yourself. But there, I keyframed it. You can do that if you want. You might have to keyframe it. I don't know what footage you're working with. Secondly, we vignette. So let's darken those corners. However, let's play around with our blue sky. So we first went into our color curves. Again, we have more of a linear curve. However, there's a slight bend at the midtones. So let's see what it looks like. Uh, let's re remove everything. So we just removed everything there. We brought everything down. It was like to here. Slight bend because we tried to make the, the shadows a bit brighter and then obviously just reduce those highlights as much as we can. And you can see we didn't even play with the color, but again, with our blue sky, we have more of a navy sky now. That is what you want. You know, like that's brilliant. So what's the second thing I did? Well, I removed the red from the image because as you can see, that tree sticks out like no one's business. And um, at nighttime, there wouldn't be much color. I actually reduced the the saturation of it even further later on and in essence I probably shouldn't have done this here and um, there's a better way to do it which I actually end up doing later on but I mean you can totally do it here I mean it's, it's you're just playing with the image colors so that's why I did with that now as for the green um I actually kind of highlighted it at the highlights Again, you're playing around with these curves and since we're on the third shot, by now you should really be comfortable with colour curves, you should be really comfortable with the ideas of affecting your highlights, your mid-tones, your shadows. You have to play around with this, okay? Because as you can see with each shot, I've been adjusting the colours in different sections of the image. So 
that's what you gotta do. Um, that's our first color curve. Now with our hue and saturation curve, this is where it gets a lot of fun. As you can see, there's a huge dramatic difference with our hue and saturation curve. So let's inspect this. As you can see, a lot is going on. Firstly, we removed, we changed the color of that red tree to blend it in with all the other trees. So it's a green tree now. But again, I guess I want to kind of Trojan horse in. You could make a film where you had like a purple tree or a pink tree or something. And you know, that could mean, for example, maybe you're shooting an autumn scene in a film, but the production schedule means you're shooting it in spring. So you can turn a red tree into a purple tree or a pink tree. Again, like I really want you to be creative. I'm trying to Trojan horse in more interesting ideas of what you can do with color. Uh, what am I doing here in the hue versus saturation? I'm removing the saturation of the, the, the colors. So if I had a green tree, as you can see there, I just had to remove the saturation from it. So I'll blend it in with all the other little trees and also all these trees, like the, the bulk of those trees, I'm just reducing the color, which likewise reduces the saturation in the water. And uh, what does this do? This is just an extra component of uh, that red tree, which we turned into a green tree. As you can see, if you had red, you can also just desaturate it that way. So you should understand what your color uh, curves are doing, your saturation curves, that's how you're manipulating an image. In terms of the hue versus luma, we targeted that sky. And as you can see, we brought the luma down of that sky individually, and we got like a nice midnight blue. I really like how this looks. I think it looks fantastic. And that's basically all we did. I mean, like, there's not really much more I can explain at this point because you guys are very familiar with my process. You're very familiar with how I'm manipulating the image. This should really start to come together for you about how I'm manipulating different colors and different parts of the picture. So that's how you get a really nice hue saturation curve. Uh, what am I doing now? I actually did another hue saturation curve. Let's go in. But as you can see, I did a shape mask and I just targeted the water here. And uh, let me just take that off. As you can see, um, if I didn't, the sky would go green, but I wanted a blue sky, but I wanted the water to look slightly murkier. You know, there's like, this, this could be a nice effect. Again, for whatever reason, if your film wants to have this effect in, because maybe it's more sci-fi, it's more vibrant, go for it. But again, I kind of wanted this to look more realistic and more seamless. So I kind of went for more of a swampy lake because again, it's nighttime. It probably would look very swampy. So again, I just go into uh, my inspector. All I did was I actually changed the hue of the water from blue to green. And I just removed some of the saturation from it. Some of you might decide to keep the saturation in because you might feel it blends better. I removed some of the saturation because I made the, the water look darker. But that's what I did there. I isolated the water and I applied my adjustments, very similar to how I isolated the water back here. Um, however, here it's more of a, you know, I did different things to it. But again, you need to think about isolating different parts of the image to, you know, make things darker, make them brighter, to kind of pull off that day to night look. And as usual, I blur the heck out of it so I can hide some mistakes that you potentially might make along the way. Because again, this isn't like you're for a client. I just did this last night in about two hours. I did all four shots in about two hours. So, you know, this isn't, this isn't perfection, but I'm just trying to show you a bit of an introduction and in how you do day and night. And even though this isn't perfection, I think it turned out pretty damn well, if I don't say so myself. So with those effects in mind, here is the before. And here is the after. I think my favorite thing is, is actually that I just changed the color of the tree. It blends in now. It actually sticks out a little bit, but again, because I kind of just rushed through it. If I had more time, you know, I could go into my saturation curves. Um, you know, potentially, you know, I can kind of, you know, see how it kind of blends in maybe just a tiny bit more if I do something like that. There is ways to manipulate the image and make it work. This is our final shot. 
And uh, this is actually what I consider the most ideal condition. Why? It's not facing the sun. And that means there's no light bleeding into the image. I mean, there's obviously a tiny bit up here, but otherwise it's actually a pretty perfect image. There's no sky, there's no light bleeding into the footage, even though it's daytime, because of the way the drone is moving, the, the, the position of the drone, it's not facing the sun. So that's perfect. This is actually why I consider the most ideal condition for doing day into night, because as I said before, this is it with a lot of light. And for you guys, you guys might find that perfect. I mean, that's a lush by itself. And in this situation, the lush by itself did its job. That looks a lot like nighttime. Why, how did I get this effect in Final Cut Pro? Uh, I actually mixed two of them. I mixed day into night, and I actually went into color looks, no, sorry, color presets. And there's one called Moonlight. So I mixed and matched those two, so. Again, this doesn't look perfect, but you know, if you're not proficient in Final Cut Pro or editing, talk to your cinematographer. Make sure he's recording the day into night footage in the best circumstances possible, which means, which means no light bleeding into your image and no sky because using just filters, this is kind of what you guys are looking for. Nevertheless, we strive for perfection. So this is ultimately what we want our version to look like. It looks far better than the Lush, but as I said before, using this Lush might work for you. Because again, you know, it, it, did, it, it did its job in this shot. But again, we're looking for something a bit more realistic, a bit more professional, and a bit more highbrow. So we're going to, again, go in and play around with all of our effects. So let's work backwards so I can kind of see what you're doing one by one. And as you can see, I have the least amount of effects here because there's not much to be done. So the first thing I did was I just applied my graduated mask just because there was a tiny bit of light coming in from above. But there's actually a more artistic reason for it later on, which I'll explain. I added my vignetting in. Vignetting is always great. And again, my color curves kind of did what they have to do. You know, I just kind of adjusted the luma, um, you know, it's linear, but there's a slight uh, uptick when it comes to more of your shadows to your midtones, because again, the image was getting so dark, you couldn't see anything. And that's never perfect either. Um, I just took a lot of red out of the image. Uh, again, full green, because at night time, you wouldn't see as much color. Um, I just removed some of the, uh, the um, saturation. Again, you probably shouldn't be removing saturation and color curves. That's probably a job for hue and saturation. But I was really rushing at this point because this was the last shot and it was like 5 a.m. or something. So I just like sped through it like no one's business. And then here you can see I did something really interesting with the blue. And that's because you have like these little blue highlights if I didn't affect the blue. Like you can kind of see them there. And again, for the shot, I was like, you know what, just let's take all the blue out of it because you can't see the sky. There's no light bleeding into the image. So there shouldn't be any semblance of blue. And there should be blue if again, there's light bleeding into your image or if you can see the sky. But if there's neither of that, no blue in your image if you're doing day and night. So I really got rid of it. And um, that's quite a, an interesting curve I got going on. But again, you're experimenting. Every shot is different. Finally, I add in my hue saturation curves. And again, what I'm really doing here is just removing the saturation from some of the grass and also removing the luma from the grass, which is how you can kind of end up with something like this. You can kind of see the way that's what I'm doing here. Um, this is really where you should be changing the saturation of the grass. You shouldn't be doing it really in color curves, which I kind of cheated and did here, but um, like it doesn't even make a difference. There, see, I got rid of it. Like, you should really be doing it in hue and saturation curves. In fact, that probably even looks better because this is the right way of doing it. So, all I did was remove the saturation from the grass and I removed some of the brightness from the grass. And um, I also removed some of this, this luma saturation. So, that's just another way of desaturating the grass and also just desaturating the image in general because at nighttime, no color is right. So, I mean, that's it. I mean, this is a pretty simple image. Again, if you're going to do a day and tonight and you have to do day and tonight, talk to your cinematographer, make sure you're recording the shots in the most ideal way possible. No light bleeding into the picture, no sky. This is kind of what you want. So let's do our before. Uh, 
and this is our after. Again, I think this looks absolutely fabulous. This is the best shot of all four of them, and like 100%, no doubt, even as an editor, like if I saw this image, I'd never know it was shot during the day. It really looks like nighttime. It looks great, and yeah, I, I think this one turned out just amazingly well. This is kind of an introduction, but also an in-depth look at how you would do day to night. And I kind of Trojan horsed in some ideas about how you can manipulate colors. So hopefully that even though you watch this for day to night, maybe it gives you some ideas in the future about how to create even more interesting and unique and creative uh, pictures. Maybe, you know, having purple skies or red skies or, you know, blood skies or something. And uh, you can hopefully make a more creative film. But uh, if you're, you know, if you're just working on a film and you need to do day to night, hopefully this gives you some ideas on how to do it. And again, I think it's another demonstration of just how powerful Final Cut Pro is. Just particularly now, I'm so glad I stuck with Final Cut Pro from the beginning because over the years they just added in so many amazing features. I mean, the fact is I could do all of this without going into DaVinci Resolve. That's fantastic. I still think it needs object, object tracking. Uh, that'd be perfect. But otherwise, you know, I can keyframe, you can do other things if it's really, you know, in-depth. Uh, obviously, take it into DaVinci Resolve. But you can just do so much now in Final Cut Pro. Uh, Final Cut Pro is my baby. And Final Cut Pro has come a long way. And there you have it. As I said before, you know, some of the shots don't look perfect. But I think it's really all about, you know, does the audience buy it? Um, you know, as long as you're mixing in those shots with some of your better looking shots, I think it'll work pretty well. And as I mentioned before, you know, if it's a 15 minute film, 20 minute film, or even a full length film, you know, a, a 10 second insert of a second unit drone, you know, of, of an area, I don't think audiences are going to think too much about it, particularly like if it's late into a film, um, you know, you're kind of just passively watching it at that point. So again, that's ultimately what it comes down to, you know, is the audience going to buy it? That's always been, you know, your main goal as an editor in every aspect. So I hope you guys enjoyed watching that very long tutorial, but I wanted to do it slowly so you guys really understood what was happening each step of the way and doing it with as many different ex examples as possible. So I hope you guys have uh, found that tutorial useful. If you want to see me do more Final Cut Pro tutorials, do leave a comment below. And um, that was my first tutorial I've ever done. Quite a long video. But um, if you guys find it helpful and you want to see more kind of tips and tricks in Final Cut Pro, uh, do let me know. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel and do all of that usual stuff, you know, liking and commenting. But um, I really hope you guys find that tutorial useful. And uh, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, stay safe wherever you are in the world. Be kind to each other. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.